Welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast with Jacob Ayers, providing actionable content to help you along your journey to financial freedom through real estate investing. As the premier asset class, real estate has helped ordinary people just like you amass fortunes. The benefits of passive income from real estate investing will allow you to live a life you want. And now your host, entrepreneur, real estate investor, and apartment deal syndicator, Jacob Ayers. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, episode 200. Hi, I'm your host, Jacob Ayers. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode. I'm so glad you're here. Today, we have a really special guest, and his name is Cliff Hayden. Cliff is a real estate investor and founder of Show Me the Rental com, an online software that automates the most difficult part of property management, finding and screening qualified leads. Now, after quitting his day job to pursue real estate investing as a career, Cliff grew tired of the hundreds of calls and emails of unqualified leads just to find out that one good renter. He was tired of managing showings and following up with people. He was struggling to find time for his family, as I'm sure you guys can all relate to. So he decided he needed to find a better way to do all of this. And when he couldn't find a better way he built it. So today I'm excited to talk with Cliff about this show me the rental software and just the ins and outs that Cliff has seen in his days of managing his own rentals. Today, I welcome on the show, Cliff Hayden. Hey, Cliff, thanks so much for joining us. Jacob, I'm excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. I love it. Well, Cliff, hey, first off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of how you got started in the world of real estate investing and just your background up to this point? Yeah, so a little bit about myself. I am married with five beautiful children. I am lucky enough now to have a freedom of a job where I can get home by three o'clock every day and get my kids off the bus and help them with homework because uh, the three little ones are still in middle school, so I can do their homework work pretty easy. The older ones, I cannot. That sounds harder than managing rentals. It's actually, you know what? It's actually fun. I actually enjoy <laughs> my little five-year-old Cooper. He's learned how to read right now and it's fun to uh, get in there and help him. It's, it's a pretty cool experience. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Cliff, how did you get started in the world of real estate investing to begin with? So I guess what sparked my interest is my brother-in-law, uh, and I'm going to name drop him, Kevin Cuccinelli, and my sister Tara were in Iraq. And when they came back from the war, they, when we visited with them, they, he was reading a Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki books. And he kind of brought him up to me and uh, he's one of my best friends now, but he also brought a game called Cash Flow. And I can remember sitting in my parents' dining room playing Cash Flow. He remembers better than I do, but basically I'm playing it and I'm going, man, you can really do stuff like this. Like you can buy houses and rent and people pay you and, and sell them off. And and he literally during the game, he noticed that I just stopped talking to everybody and just was kind of the wheels were turning. That's kind of where my interest sparked. And from there, I just started educating and growing my knowledge and buying real estate. That's awesome. So here you are like fresh with real estate in your mind mind playing this cash flow quadrant game, which is a really cool game that Robert Kiyosaki developed. And you're kind of like, just kind of the wheels are turning. You're thinking, wow, I could do this in real life. So what did that next step look like for you? Did it take a while before you actually put those wheels in motion? Or what was your first step after that? So at this time in my life, I was say early 20s and I had a real job. I was uh, worked at at and and I was what they called an outside plant technician, which was a fancy word for construction worker. So I drove around the big bucket trucks and put up telephone lines. I'm from Kentucky all through Kentucky. And then I would luckily have the opportunity to go out of town on storm damages and make some good money on overtime and working. I had a full-time job and Robert Kiyosaki, he had a coaching class too. And I signed up for his coaching class on how to do real estate and do different things. And the coach got me to buy a duplex, which I'm not knocking Robert Kiyosaki, he helped me a ton. But this particular program, the duplex I bought was a horrible deal. I just didn't know it better. And so I just kind of jumped in. And the good thing that came out of it is when I was calling, I had a good down payment. When I called around to get loans, one of the loan officers just knew that I needed help. It's nice to have guys that you know, like can see I'm young and don't know really what I'm doing, trying to take a chance. So he introduced me to a club called our local RIA club, our local real estate club. And so I had no idea that I even existed. And so I started going to that club and I met a guy named Mike Butler, who then became my mentor. And so he had a mentoring program and I signed up for it and I was all excited because I owned a duplex. And I'll never forget going into his office for the first day thinking, you know what, I'm 20 some years old, I own a duplex, I'm doing well. And he literally makes fun of me 
me for like three minutes about how stupid it was to buy that duplex. <laughs> it just crushed my dreams. And I don't know if anyone knows Mike. He's a pretty, he's been around for a while, but that's just his personality. But he got me thinking he was a friend of the family come to find out down the road that my dad coached him in football. And anyway, Louisville kind of a, know a lot of people if you're from a certain area. And so he kind of took me under, so he didn't kind of, he took me under his wing. I started uh, doing deals from there by working a full-time job. Awesome. Now let's talk about that duplex. What made it a bad deal? Was it that particular property? Was it the asset type? What was it that you didn't like about it? What was it that wasn't working? For me personally, everybody that gets in this business, well, there's certain things you like and don't like. And my business is now built around my lifestyle. What do I want my life to be? Not so much how much money. And so what the problem was, it was in not a nice area. The numbers on paper made sense. And if you've done this long enough, numbers make sense a lot. But there's also what numbers don't tell you, which is the management intensive properties. So different areas, different type of properties, you have a lot more management than you do on other ones. So this particular duplex, I did not know how to manage. It wasn't in a great part of town. So it basically, it could have became a little holiday inn because I was over there all the time. Somebody called, I jumped. I didn't know what I was doing as far as management goes. So I was just like, oh, there's a problem. Let's go fix it. Not training my tenants that you're an adult. You can start taking care of some of your own problems. I didn't know any better. So I just went over there and did it all. Cut the grass, weed eat it, painted. They had any kind of little issue. I remember it was so bad. The lady wanted to clean behind her fridge. I went over there and moved her fridge out for her. But she could move <laughs> behind her fridge and just, just didn't know. And so just all the time wasted on just silly stuff. And so, but it did get me in the game and it got me hooked up with our local RIA club and it got me some mentoring and I got networking around some great group of guys and just kind of started building and growing from there. Yeah. And one thing I really want to pull out here, Cliff, is doing that first deal for you wasn't a home run ride. It wasn't maybe even a great deal, but no matter what, that first deal you do, you're going to learn so much from, right? There's just so much you can read and learn and books and forums and networking events and things until you actually buy that first deal, do that first deal. There's only so much you can learn in theory and on paper and in talking with people until you really put those wheels in motion. You don't really know what you don't know. It's exactly right. So with this property, you kind of realized that, hey, it looked good on paper. The numbers looked good, but it was that management piece that was a little intensive for you, huh? And that's kind of what broke the deal or made the deal not so great, it sounds. Yes. I had high turnover, so I really wasn't making any money. It's just silly stuff I didn't know at the time. The meters weren't separated, so there was just one LG&E bill. The water meters weren't separated, so there was one water bill. So you couldn't really split it. So you added into the rent. Well, they're jacking up. You know, they don't care. They're jacking up the heat, jacking up the air. I mean, all kinds of things that you just didn't know when I first started because I didn't have the education or the mentor or help. And so the good thing was I had a job. So when I first started in real estate, the rentals were basically a retirement fund. I, I didn't need them to live on. I had a job that put food on the table and provided for us. Yeah, sure. So, well, you made it through this first duplex, it sounds. So what was next for you? You know, a lot of lessons learned there. And did you take anything away from that at first deal into your next one? I don't like duplexes. That's what I took away. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. I love duplexes, but um, to each their own, I guess. So what was the next deal and why not duplexes? So once I got into this business, I like single family houses. And I'll tell you what, I'm getting really big on VRBOs. We have a couple of VRBO properties yeah. and the math on high end VRBO properties is really, really ridiculous. Real quickly for the listeners that might not know what VRBO is, please explain. VRBO is a vacation rental by owner. So you got VRBO and Airbnb. Yeah. Airbnb is more your short term. I'm going to stay the night somewhere in a city. I got to fly out the next day. It actually stands for air mattress and breakfast in bed. The guys who invented it were from San Francisco. Really cool guys. Really cool story on how they found a niche and needed money and what they how they came up with it. And I don't know if you got time for me to tell it, but I think it's a great story. Yeah, enlighten us, please. I don't know so much of the background as to the uh, founders of Airbnb, but I'm very familiar with what it is. I'll tell it the best I know it. So Okay. They lived in San Francisco. There were two guys and they had an apartment and they or a house and they were having trouble paying their bills. And so what they did is they decided to rent out air mattresses in their rooms and rent out different rooms in their house. And you slept on, a, slept on an air mattress for 80 bucks, I believe somewhere around there, 80 bucks. And then they served you breakfast in bed on your air mattress the next day. And so they try to make money and they found out that, man, there's a big niche for this because San, if you've ever been to San Francisco, it's expensive. Yes. I mean, it's crazy expensive, especially compared to Kentucky, a whole different <laughs> um, class. So anyway, and so I like started doing that, found a niche, and then just started growing it and growing it and building it and then building it into what it is today. And then VRBO was similar, but VRBO is more of a long term. I'm going to take my family somewhere. We're going to go on a vacation in a nice home. And so when we travel, I have five kids. So we always VRBO because hotels are just a pain and getting separate rooms and your kids running around in the hall. You know, it's just too.
too much chaos. And so yeah. having a house where we can all be together and that's the whole point of vacation and then cook out and eat. And actually the math on VRBOs are great if you're traveling because you can save money on just food alone saves you a ton of money if you got a bunch of kids. Yeah, sure. I uh, do Airbnb and VRBO and I go on trips a lot. So if you got a big group of friends, you're right. That VRBO is usually like larger house that you'll stay in for a weekend or more plus. And yeah, great opportunities for those travelers and great opportunities for those owners too. So that kind of seems to be where you moved on from that duplex since you uh, didn't quite like that asset class. So tell us about that and kind of what was next for you in the investing world of yourself. So when I got with my mentor, I'm not knocking duplexes. I think commercial property is great. It's just not my forte. It's yeah, not my, sure, sure. Uh, what I like. So what I didn't like about the duplex was when I went to sell it, it's hard to find an owner occupant that pays high dollar for a duplex. So you sell to investors who, kind of, who want deals. And so I ended up losing quite a bit on that deal, but I learned so much from it and hooked up with knowledge that I gained. It was incredible. So I started buying single family properties. I started buying a lot of them. So one of the big mistakes I made is I bought way too many houses way too fast. This is back in 2000 and I want to say six and seven and eight. When you had a good job back then, it was right when the crash started coming, they would loan you money like it was water. Like it was just amazing how much money. And I thought I was doing something illegal. I can remember going to closings and buying a house and they would give me the rehab money at the closing. I didn't even do the rehab yet. And I was going, they just give you checks. And I was like, this can't be right. This is, can't be normal. So then I started buying single family houses way too many, way too fast. And I wasn't buying the right properties for me at the time. I didn't know it, but it was just that learning curve. And so again, I was buying neighborhoods. I wish I wouldn't have got in, but it, it worked out okay. And then the problem was when I bought too many, I still didn't have that management thing down right. And so we had a lot of turnovers, a lot of maintenance stuff still going on, but I just worked and worked and worked until I figured out, hey, let's get systems in place here. Let's get stuff in place to make this thing run smooth. My mentor already has it. I just need to implement it. And so I just started kind of working hard and figuring out what problems I had and fixing that, taking one problem, fixing that problem, and going to the next one and then the next one and building from there. Yeah, I want to get into that management piece. And that'll kind of be probably the main topic of today's show. Like you said, with that duplex, the numbers made sense. It looked good on paper. And in fact, it probably was if you were just to have managed it right or known what that management yes. piece was going to be, right? So this management piece in real estate can really make or break the investment. If you know what you're doing and you know how to manage that particular asset class, then great. But if not, you'll be over there moving fridges for little old ladies every day, right? And, you know, sweeping floors and painting and doing all this stuff. So walk us through how you kind of improve those management processes and systems. I really love talking about processes and systems because you can automate and outsource those things, but you're not over there requiring Cliff to be at the duplex every first to collect rent and every work order and things. So tell us about some of the systems and processes you built. Okay. So I'll start from, I have since kind of jumped into real estate and started buying houses, had a full time job. I ended up quitting my job. And so one big key was to have more time as I quit my job. And I am proud of this. I do proud of this. I hold the longest suspension in at t history. And so I was suspended for four and a half months. What does that mean? It doesn't sound good. So I wanted to, I had real estate and I just, I'm trying to say this right without getting too much detail. So when I first started, it was called Bell South and then at t bought out Bell South and merged. Okay. Bell South, I loved and I wanted to work that corporate ladder. I was a construction worker. I wanted to be a supervisor. I wanted to be a first level, second level, work my way up that ladder. I found out that at that job, when I thought we were kind of a family, everybody kind of wanted to help, the further up or more I learned, the longer I was there, they didn't really care. You were basically a puppet on a string and uh, they pull your strings and it got to the point to where I just hated going there. They beat you up and browbeat you on any kind of accident you got in or anything that happened. And my thought was, we're in construction, stuff's going to happen. I mean, it's just when you're working with big tools and big trucks, you're going to get dings and banged up a little bit. That's just what happens. So anyway, I had a bunch of houses. I knew if I could do real estate full time, I could make it. But I come from a very humble beginnings of lower middle class families. And my parents, I was instilled to go to school, get a degree, get a job and go from there, work your way up. And so I wanted to quit and I didn't have the guts to just all out quit because it was a good job. I mean, I was making 60, 80 thousand dollars a year. And so it couldn't have worked out better. They popped me with a random drug test. And when you have a drive a bucket truck, you have a CDL license and they do random drug tests. And so I told my boss, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to take it. And when you don't take a drug test, it's the same as failing a drug test. And then you have to go to rehab. And so when you go to rehab, you're on suspension. So you get the classes taken care of. And so just pieces of the puzzle that worked out are so cool. So my rehab counselor happened to be my aunt and uncle's next door neighbor who I knew and very cool guy. So I kind of comfortable with him, told him um, what I was doing. He kind of laughed and 
thought I was crazy. I just said, man, I just need time to see if I can do this real estate thing before I quit. So this was an intentional sabbatical, it sounds. Yes, it was. It was intentional because I didn't want to walk away because at that I'm 20 years old. There's not a lot of kids making the amount of money I was making doing. Literally, we took a drill and drilled in a, in a piece of wood. I mean, we put up telephone lines. It wasn't rocket science. It was a little dangerous. And I had, I love, it was fun, but it was very planned uh, suspension just to see if I could make it. And so basically I took eight hours of rehab and turned it into four and a half months. And I think I had a couple of, sad to say, I think I had a couple grandmas pass and um, sickness and illness. I had to miss appointments and I uh, kept dragging it out. So finally my boss called and was like, you got two days to get back in here or you're fired. And I was lucky enough to say, you know what? I quit. I actually end up in my first month of doing real estate on my own. I made my salary that I made at at t my first month of doing this on my own. And so I knew from there I could do it and I uh, took the next step. Awesome. Yeah, that's an interesting jump into doing real estate full time, being able to test those waters like that. It's a scary jump. I haven't quite made it myself either, but uh, lots of people want to have that proven other stream of income before they quit their day job. For you, you're able to kind of take that sabbatical, test out the waters, realize you were going to be able to make it and then took that plunge. So tell us about that mindset. What was going through your mind at that time? Like you said, you're going to give up a really good day job, right? To kind of go pursue real estate. I think it comes back to um, your comfort zone. You got to figure out what you want in life. And so I just wasn't happy. So I, I just want to change. I looked at some of the older guys that I work with and super nice guys, but their backs are broke down. They got bad knees. I mean, I just was like, I don't want to, this is not who I want to be in 30 years. I'm not to get too cliche, but you only live once. If I'm going to go out, I want to go over the bang. I wanted to see if I can make it. And so I think you just got to have the guts. And I think to me, you just know there's going to come a time when you're doing real estate in your job and gut's going to start, for me, my gut just started saying, you know what, this direction I want to head in. And you just got to listen and hopefully you listen and go from there. Yeah, awesome. So here you are in about the pre-2008 timeframe, buying all these houses. How does that pan out for you? And tell us kind of about that process there. So what I did when I quit my job, it just timing. So I ended up becoming a foreclosure buyer's agent and uh, did not understand what that was, but just I was there at the time the market crashed. So if you were a buyer's agent and a foreclosure and that crash, you could make some serious money. And so I became an agent. The problem when I quit my job, stuff you don't foresee is when you quit your job, guess what? They don't give you loans anymore because you don't have a job. When you're self-employed, you had to wait two years. So I stopped buying houses for two years, which in hindsight was a blessing because I was digging a deep hole with debt and leveraging myself pretty hard because I had that job. And it worked out great that I stopped buying. And, and so I started building up cash and started becoming a buyer's agent. I loved doing that. It was something new. And I worked and I worked and I put in a lot of hours at the sacrifice of my family, which we can talk about about later. I'll bring that up on how I do things now. And then also I found niches. So what I did is I would listen to what was going on in the market and I would say, okay, I can do that or I can do this. And so one of the big niches at that time frame was a lot of foreclosure agents. The banks needed contractors to fix up houses because they've never seen a crash like this. In our town, thousands of empty houses and people would just leave and they would leave and turn off the electric. Basements were flood. I mean, everything would just go bad. Basements were flood. Squatters would come in. People would vandalize, steal the ACACs. And so I found a niche on, they needed people to help fix these houses up. So so I said, you know what? I'm doing that now. I can do that. And so I started a G the general contracting company. And it just so happens that I hooked up with some of the bigger foreclosure agents in town and started running those jobs. And then they needed grass cutters and then they needed property preservation people. And so I was just like, hey, let's do it. So we just kept uh, kind of building that way and building up cash. And the problem was, is I was spending a lot of cash. I was making a lot, but because I wasn't home and doing what I should have been doing with my wife and my kids, I tried to make up for that for buying toys and buying nice things and um, I'll have some regrets. When we can talk, I have some regrets with that. I wish I'd have done it different. But I thought at that time, being a dad and being a provider and a husband is that's what I was supposed to do. From where I came from is that money makes us happy. The biggest problem I did, I made money a goal and not a tool. And so it engulfed me and it took years off, it, you know, three or four years. I don't even remember because all I did was work, work, work and just grind and hustle. I don't have a lot to show for it besides the unhappy wife, which I've been spending the last five or six years getting that back together. Yeah. Well, something you mentioned earlier in the show, I jotted down here is you built the business around the lifestyle you wanted. And I think that's really important and one of the huge benefits that real estate offers. So let's get into that a little bit. And what do you mean by that? And what are you doing now that you're able to uh, live the lifestyle you want with the business you've built? So once I got to a certain financial point, I thought new guys, I'm trying to think back when I was new, you know, if I just get here, I'll be happy. If I just get this much money, I'll be okay. But it never stops. It's always the next step, the next level, the next spot. So what I learned was my life is not what I want it to be. We got money, we got a nice house, the kids got a lot of toys, but nobody's happy. I would come home for dinner. And when I would come home at night, I wasn't really present because I had 50 things going on. So I'd become, I, this is, I'll tell you how this got started. I was sitting at the dinner table several nights.
lights and my phone would ring. I get text messages, I get emails and I'm always talking while we're supposed to be having family dinner. And my wife is just livid. I tell this story several times. If you remember Superman, when his eyes got real red and shot lasers out, <laughs> that's what she would do. And it caused problems. And we were both arguing back and forth as you need to be a good father. You need to stay home, be with the kids. And I'm going, you see this house? Do you see this food? Do you, you know, it doesn't make it put itself on the table. And so we're going back and forth, nothing productive. And I'm going, this has got to stop. Like, this is not what I got in this business to do. This is horrible. And so what I found myself doing as far as the rental houses go, we would have three or four empty rental houses and it's nonstop phone calls, nonstop emails, just talking to the same person over and over. It's a three bedroom, two bath. This is blah, blah, blah. And I started set finding out that, hey, I'm asking the same questions. We're asking, are you on Section 8? How long are you in your current residence? How much money do you make? Are you willing to send a three-year lease? And then we would screen them and then go, okay, well, that's what kind of what we're looking for. So here's how you go see the house. And we set up an appointment. And I got to thinking at the table, like there's got to be a system out there that automates this whole process. There's got to be because I got to get my life back. And so I looked around for a while and could not find anything. And so I just decided to build it. That's where Show Me the Rental was born. And Show Me the Rental was born just so I can be at home and actually be at home. And so the big problem I was having back, I'm gonna back up a hair is I thought I was providing for my family, but I really wasn't providing for them because I wasn't there. You know, I wasn't there to help and talk and, and help raise them, help raise my kids. And so for the last five or six years, I have literally transformed my business into where I put life first in real estate and my business second. And I have not been happier in years than I am now. Still not perfect, but we're getting there. And how's your business doing And when you put it in that perspective too? So now I have people in place to help me. I have systems built. So for instance, we use with today's technology, it's so great. There's so many different things out there you can use. And so for us, we use a property management software called Buildium. We love Buildium. We use Show Me the Rental to when you get a house on the market, we put it on Show Me the Rental. It advertises, generates leads, pre-screen the leads and automates the showings all at the click of a button. So what we do is I have a property manager named Gary. Um, he's been with me. He actually started as a maintenance guy and has worked his way up. And he's been with me now for around 11 years, 12 years. And I help him buy houses and fix them up and a uh, very trustworthy, honest guy. And he takes care of all the crap I don't like to do. So one of the big things I did in my business to kind of get me over the hump is uh, there was a guy named Bob Steele from Baltimore. He's a friend of a friend. And I remember sitting with him on lunch and he seemed so happy and had his stuff together. And so I said, what do you do to make it? And he goes, I literally took a piece of paper, drew a line through it and wrote on there what I like to do, and what I don't like to do. I ripped it in half and I went out and found somebody that did what I don't like to do. He said, my whole life life and business transform. And so that's what I did. And so Gary runs all the stuff I don't like to do. I don't like to run applications. I don't like to do lease agreements. I don't like to talk to tenants. He handles all that. What I like to do is collect rent. I like to watch my bank accounts and do, I'm basically involved with all the money. Anything that has to do with money in my business, I have, I'm involved in it. Gary handles all the other stuff I don't like to handle. I have two other VAs uh, that work with me, just stay at home moms and they work at nights. And basically what we do is I don't like sending seven day letters out and I don't like doing evictions or collections. So one of my VAs, that's all she does. She handles that part of it. She also does um, very smart. She's a lot smarter than me, thankfully. We have projects that I want to work on. For instance, property taxes, putting a system together for that, putting a system together for we appeal our property taxes. So we have different projects and I tell her what I want and then she puts all that together for me because I don't like doing that. What I like doing is this right here, Jacob. I like podcasts. I like pitching things. I like traveling with my family. And so I spend all my time doing that stuff that I like to do, which is very fun. Yeah, sure. Cliff, you and I would not make very good business partners because we enjoy the same thing. <laughs> Things, right? We wouldn't complement our strengths very well. So you and I would just both would be wanting to do podcasts and buy properties yeah. and our taxes would fall to the wayside, right? So, so yeah, that's awesome. I think it's really important to build that business around the lifestyle because that's what you're doing this for, right? You're out here buying real estate and investing in real estate so that you can live the life you want. And if it's consuming your life, then what's the point? Just stay at your AT&T job, make it home every night for dinner, right? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. There's absolutely, I could have stayed there, worked for 30 years, retired a millionaire. If I put stuff, if I I put away money in my 401k and there's nothing wrong with that at all. I just wanted something different. In my mind, I wanted a different path. Yeah, sure. So I can really, really uh, sympathize with where you're at with that property management headache because my very first failure as a, an investor was I just leased to the very first person that came to me with <laughs> no criteria in mind, right? And you know how that goes. I've done that. I did that for operate like that for years because I had so much stuff going on. I didn't have time and it was just like another fire that I just wanted to put out. That was the biggest problem we had in management was I'm running a general contracting company, grass cutting. I'm an agent. I got so many things going on 
home and I had an empty rental house, it's kind of like a bank. If you kind of fogged up a mirror and you had money in the bank, I would rent to you. Well, it bit me in the ass because six months down the road, I'm filing an eviction or they're, um, when they leave the turnover, they trash the house and I'm spending four or 5,000 fixing it back up. And I'm going, oh my God, this has got to stop. This is horrible. Like this is not a good business plan. You're not going to make it. Thank God I had that other income to offset that because I was really losing on the rental side because I was not doing a good job. And so the big epiphany I, that I had too was I looked through my portfolio and I had just about a half, a, about a dozen, a little over a dozen properties that were the headache houses. And I was like, you know what? If I want this lifestyle, I got to get rid of these headaches. And so what I did, the market started coming back around. So as soon as these rentals started becoming empty, I fixed them up and sold them for top dollar. And so now my new goals are to get out of debt. So I'm a Dave Ramsey fan. I like to get out of debt. You don't have a lot of worries if you don't have a lot of debt and you don't need a lot of money if you don't have a lot of debt. And so I started, my new motto is I own just you know a few dozen houses, but they're all A and B quality houses. They're all three bed. My cookie cutter is a three bedroom, two bath with a basement and a garage. Just a simple little one story, a uh, hip roof or gable roof and plumbing stacks. Or, everything's really simple. So I can set them up correctly from the beginning now with the plumbing, the electric, and they shouldn't have problems for years. And then it gives me the opportunity to the management now is so much easier because you're dealing with a different type of customer or tenant. So now I can travel. I was up to double that years ago with rental houses thinking that's what you needed 100 houses for some reason, which you don't. I don't think. Each their own if you want that many. But if you got 20, 30 houses paid for, you don't have a lot of worries. You can kind of live whatever life you want. And I would suggest that on top of that, you need to do some tax-free investing. So I'm big in IRAs and solo 401ks and I have five kids. So I also do a lot of, they're called CISA accounts, Coverdale Educational Savings Accounts. And I do tax-free investing through there for their college funds. For me, I kind of sat down and said, okay, big picture here. Forget this short term. What, what do I want my life to be about? And it came down to me as family. If my kids are screwed up, who cares how much money you have? If your wife's miserable because you're never home or you can't have a conversation with her because you got so much stuff going on, who cares how much money you have? That was that crossroad I came to it and I chose the right path. And so that's what I do now. So now I buy nice quality houses in nice areas, nice neighborhoods. I make them very nice and I'm very strict on how I screen tenants now. So all my tenants now have been on their job for at least five years. All of them have money in their bank account. So when something goes wrong, they're going to be able to pay their rent. The reason to buy a nice neighborhoods for me and my lifestyle is I want tenants who rent is their first priority. A roof over their heads is their first priority, not their fourth or fifth priority. And yeah, so I don't sure. have to chase them down. I don't have to chase them down for money or filing evictions. We literally now with the houses we have, we have maybe, maybe two turnovers a year. That's it. It's very manageable, very easy. It gives me the ability. My wife works for a, a high school, so she's off all summer. It gives us the ability now. We travel all summer with our kids. They get to pick where they want to go. And we kind of, last year we were in an RV and went out west. I've set up my business to be able to run it remotely. So now what I do with Gary and my VAs, Jen and Bev, is we literally have weekly agendas and weekly meetings. And I can do that wherever. They know what I want, what I'm looking for, and they have their things to do. And we just talk about it and they take care of it. And That's it's awesome. Great light. Yeah, I'm very blessed. I'm still not perfect. Don't get me wrong. My wife still gives me that look from time to time, the Superman look, but we're getting a lot better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hey, Cliff, for the people who are listening to this show and thinking, man, I'd really love to improve my processes on management and screening and placing tenants and decreasing my turnover, what kind of actionable tips would you have for those people? What are some real easy, low hanging? fruit that you were able to implement quickly in your own portfolio? What worked for you? What are some common mistakes? Kind of give us some actionable uh, kind of advice there, if you will. I would say, first off, you need to plan, figure out what you want to do. And second, you need to get education. You need to network. You need to see what other people are doing. And for me, it was you need to find out who you are and figure out what you like and don't like to do. And so what I implement, I love technology. So I implement, of course, I'm partial to it. Show me the rental. It takes care of every advertising and the automation of getting qualified leads into the houses. So I don't have to talk to them. We literally don't, Gary doesn't talk to a potential tenant anymore until after they fill out the application and we have some questions about their app and getting documents in on top of their app. That saves us a ton of time. We use Buildium as a property management software to, it's online to collect our rents, do online leases. We don't have to physically do a lease anymore. At the office, we just do it online. Maintenance now is done online and we email it out to our vendors, our contractors. And then I spend time doing what I like, which is putting deals together, spending time with my family and building tax-free wealth, which, which is the phase I'm in now. So my phase is now, I kind of got my lifestyle taken care of. I'm wanting to build tax-free investments now. Yeah, sure. So for you, it's kind of that automation, outsource, do the things you like, leverage technology, leverage other people who their strengths complement yours. And they like doing those things that you don't like. And, you know, kind of comes together as this well-oiled machine. 
Yes. It's oil. It can always improve. But yes, it's it's working well for us now. Yeah, that's awesome. It's hard to uh, meet up with a prospective tenant and show them the property or sign a lease when you're in an RV heading out west with your family for the summer, right? So you've got to be able to leverage that technology and kind of uh, screen those tenants properly and remove yourself from the funnel, if you will. Yes, I need to be doing, and you probably heard it before, I need to be looking at my business from a 10,000 foot view. I don't need to be in there doing everything. I just need to look and make sure it's running right. And then when there's problems, then let's address those problems and get them fixed so we don't keep having the same problem and just from there yeah that's a really hard thing for people to do especially getting started because they have to be in the weeds kind of learning those things and doing those things it's because they don't have the resources to outsource right so like think of like that 25 year old who just bought that first property or, or that 25 year old cliff right who has that duplex it's hard to kind of come up look at that 10,000 foot view and think like hey i need to be directing these people that i don't have or these resources i don't have right so that's a really hard phase for a lot of people to kind of hold themselves themselves up and get out of that. And I just thought of a story, if you don't mind me telling. So Please. when I first started, I did a lot of work myself. So the first houses I bought, I was over there demoing. I was over there painting everything I could do. One of my first plumbers that I used, I met at AT&T. He was working in the bathroom at AT&T. <laughs> he would help me. He said, sure. So I went over there and I grunted for a plumber for a year and a half. Literally, I would go, we would work on jobs together. He became a real good friend of mine. I actually helped him start up his own plumbing company, which I'm proud of. And he does very well today. I didn't even know what a vent was. I thought a vent was what was on the like a register on the wall. I didn't realize plumbing drain lines had vents going out the roof. I had no idea. So he yeah. kind of showed me, I would say get in there and get dirty. I agree. And just not to know how to do it all, but just understand how houses work and what issues are. So for us now, one of the big things we do that I wish I'd have done when I was younger is we replace all the water lines now with PEX. And we run them with almost like a home run line. There's no shortcut. So there's no chance of a pipe busting. We run very long runs and then we redo all the drain lines and we set everything up nice and clean. We get rid of a tip I would suggest for new people. We get rid of gas water heaters use electric now because electric doesn't have vents you don't have a vent in your roof which will cause a leak eventually because plumbing boots always leak we use 90 percent furnaces and we go out the house because we don't want a vent in the roof that's going to leak and so yeah. we kind of set our houses up differently from learning our the maintenance issues you were having and said okay let's fix this issue and i think getting in there with your helpers and learning and getting dirty in the beginning if that's what you like to do i like doing construction that's what i did and just learning the in and outs of how things work so when somebody talks to you, a contractor you know yeah that's wrong or that's right or this guy's honest or not and you can kind of slowly grow your business from there yeah i love it well uh any kind of actionable tips for people to implement any kind of things to look out for when screening tenants any kind of like advice there you've got for people i'll tell you how we screen our tenants i don't know how everybody else does it but in my lifestyle now we're looking for a long-term customer i call them customers because that's to me what they are i want to build a relationship with them i want somebody who's going to stay for a while so based around my lifestyle we sign a minimum of a three-year lease we try to get a five-year but a minimum three-year lease wow because Okay. And I tell them straight up, if you stay for a year and move, if the minimum I got to do is paint carpet, I just lost all my cash flow. So I want you to stay. I want somebody a little longer term. Now we have a little house that families can grow in is what we look for now. And so I would say you really need to figure out, it goes back to your lifestyle. So we, like I said before, don't take Section 8 anymore. In our town, it's getting um, very complicated and inspections for those have been getting out of control. So we stopped doing that. So that's our number one question. Are you on Section 8? That screens out 80, 60% of our leads. We also do how long you've been on your current job. So in this business, you want somebody who has responsibility and can hold a job because if they're moving, and every get a new job every two years, eh, something's going on. So we also want to know how much money you have in the bank because we want to know, are you responsible enough to have a, an emergency fund? Something, so if something goes bad, you're not going to sit there and go, oh my God, what do I do now? And that's what we want to see. And if that gets them into the house and then from there, we're going to verify their information. Once we verify it and talk to them for a while, uh, you just get a good feeling. And usually the people who get you the information fast, the responsible ones that you want to look at, if they're dragging their feet, it takes them four or five days or a week to get you the information, you're going to have problems down the road on the telltale sign of are they going to pay the rent on time. Yeah, sure. And here's what I found with doing automated leases. And I'm sure you've seen the same thing, Cliff, is you send somebody an electronic lease or, or application that is actually application first phase, right? And they can't manage to fill out the application and send it back or they don't have an email or whatever it is. It's like, really trust you to go pay rent then on this portal or whatever your process is. Another thing I see a lot, and maybe you, you've seen this too, is uh, references. Is your reference your mom? Is your previous yeah. landlord your mom? If so, red flag, right? I don't rent 
to anybody anymore who their reference and their previous landlord is their family member, right? Because that just throws up a red flag and I've had a few issues there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You need to get with somebody in your town that knows what they're doing. There's a lot of older guys out there and you take them out to lunch, man, they'll tell you a lot of stuff and kind of figure out, kind of help you figure out what you want to do in real estate. Yeah, sure. Well, Cliff, what are your next goals? What's the next phase look like for you? What do you want to do? How do you want your real estate to kind of play into your life? Talk us through, you know, what's next for you? So my next goal, I call it the 15, 815. So what that means is um, I have three different kind of areas of business I'm growing. So I want to be debt free and have a uh, cash flow coming in at 15,000 a month and not to pay for my lifestyle. The 800 is I have five kids in CISA accounts. Each kid, if you know, on college is going to be roughly about 40,000 a year. So that's roughly $800,000. It's going to cost uh, for college. If you pay that after taxes, it's about 1.3, 1.4 million dollars. Right now we're doing investments in their CISA accounts to give them an upper hand when they go to college. And our thought on college is I'm a UPS is big in our town and I love their program of we'll pay for your college, but here's your grade average. Here's this, here's, I'm going to give you this money, but you're going to earn it, work for it. And then the other 15 is 15,000 a month in tax-free accounts. So I have an IRA and, and a solo 401k I just started and I want to be able to have 15,000 a month tax-free coming in when I retire. Cool. I like how you just kind of did that 15, 815 rule. Like it means something to you. It's not necessarily a rule of thumb or it's not a rule that's going to apply to myself, right? But yeah. I like how you've kind of tailored it to yourself and it kind of resonates with you. Cool. I like that. Awesome. Well, Cliff, hey, as we're wrapping up here, we've got a lightning round, just a series of questions we ask every one of our guests. Are you up for it? Let's do it. All right. The first question is, what was your biggest hurdle getting started investing in real estate? And then what did you do to overcome that? Biggest hurdle was just the fear of the unknown. I think that's when you start out, you're just like, does this stuff really work? Am I going to be able to do it? That was my biggest fear. It is very uncomfortable to get out of your comfort zone and do something you're scared about. And so my motto is kind of like Nike is eventually you just got to do it. I tell everybody it's not going to work out perfect. And if it did, everybody would do it. If it was easy, everybody would be doing this. It does take a lot of discipline and, and persistence. And my motto is you can't fail if you don't quit. So just stick with it and stay with it. The good thing about real estate is time fixes everything. So if you buy something wrong over the long haul, it's going to work itself out. If the cash flow doesn't work right, it's going to keep going up till it does. It's going to pay down. So if you stick with it, it's a great investment. So just do it. You just got to jump in and go. I love it. Well, do you have a personal habit that contributes to your success? So I would say that's a good question. So what I kind of do is kind of cliche. I'm the golden rule. So I treat people how I want to be treated. I'm very high in integrity. I work hard. I never forget where I come from. And so, and I want to be around those type of people. I don't want to be around people who play in that gray area. I don't want to find people who are a little shady. I want to be around a certain type of person like me so we can really help each other and grow. And so that's kind of, I contribute that. Another one, just personally, I started doing a routine. So every morning now and at night, I have routines that I do. And it just starts, ends my day peacefully and starts my day exciting. I get excited now. Instead of just what I used to do, I was so busy. I'd wake up, grab my phone, check emails, see what uh, problems yeah. I have and just start and go. And I was like, oh my God, it was just so nerve wracking. And so I started to have a routine now and I follow that pretty much every morning. I don't say I'm perfect because I'm not, but I follow it every morning and I just kind of wake up a certain way and I read a short story and then I meditate for a minute. I know it sounds weird. I got some back problems, some lower back from sports injury. So I do a little yoga in the morning. Oh, that's awesome. Them, yeah. It feels great. So I love it. So uh, it's me going. Yeah. I love to stretch in the morning. It's something new. I've been trying and uh, super unflexible. So yeah, just I think having that anchor to start your day or end your day, really powerful stuff. A lot of people out there do it. So yeah, really cool. Well, I'm going to tee this one up for you. Do you have an online resource that you find valuable in your day to day? I can think of one. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you two, actually. Okay. So of course, of course, show me the rental. So I would say just try it out. And if you're in the management business, it's going to be a ton of time and it's not expensive. I, I don't think we went over price. It's, I made it as cheap as we could possibly make it. It's $49 until your property is rented. So it does all of this for 49 bucks, no subscription, no monthly fee. It's just $49 flat fee until your property is rented. I would say check it out and try it. I think it'll let you have dinner with your family again. That's kind of the goal. Well, that'll pay for the dinner, right? That'll pay for the dinner. <laughs> yeah. and so the other one is, I started using an app. I think it's pretty cool. I want to share with people. It's called Blinkist. Have you ever heard of it? I have. I've seen a lot of uh, social media advertised for it, but I've never used it. I'm a big I, Audible book guy. So uh, tell us about it. 
So that's what I do in the morning. I do not like to read. I can read for around 15 or 20 minutes and my brain just shuts down kind of. Okay. Can't comprehend. So what Blinkist does, it basically takes a book and writes a book report and goes over all the hot points and what the book's about. So I read that every morning for around 15, 20 minutes. I can get a book read. And they also have an audio book for it. So you can actually they'll read you the book report. Uh-huh. And so I use that a lot and it helps me just kind of keep my mind fresh. And mind, just like my money, I want to use my mind as a tool and not as just always have it on. I got to be able to turn it off because yeah. you get crazy. Yeah. And your mind is kind of a product of what you put into it, right? So if you're always worrying about stuff or checking email or listening to junk, then that's what's going to be in your mind. But if you're filling it up every morning with little good stories here, tidbits of just whatever you want to fill your mind with is what's going to be in there. So you have to remember that and be keen on that. Yes, I agree. Well, on that note, what book would you recommend to the listeners and why? So for new guys, I think back of two books that really took me off. And I'm sure most of them know Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Sure, yeah. And then a guy by the name of John Schaub. It's called Building Wealth One House at a Time. He's out of Florida. He's one of my mentors also. Great, super nice guy down to earth. Great book. And then I've also read a book called recently called Traction. And it's how to implement a business plan. I've heard a lot about that book. I need to pick it up. It's helped me very well. So the problem, one of the problems I had in my business with these weekly meetings we have with our people in the office, our staff, is I wasn't very good at making sure they did everything on a timely manner. I was too nice. I'm always too nice. And so it kind of helps you in a not a abrasive way or obtrusive way, but just kind of make sure, hey, here's our deadline. We got to get this done. If not, you need to let me know why, what. And then my plan is, here's our deadline. You agree to it. We got to make sure we get it done. And so that's Blinkist helps a lot with that. I'm sure that applies to yourself too, right? Sometimes you have to hold yourself accountable. Like, hey, you said you're going to do this this week. Did you? Did you not? Why? Why not? You know, I got to do that to myself sometimes. Well, Cliff, last question in our lightning round. If you were to give advice to your 20-year-old self to get started investing in real estate, what would you go back and tell yourself? In today's market, I'm really big on VRBOs. So I would tell myself, hey, let's educate on these. There's a lady named Beth Carson, who I really like. She has a free book. She's kind of the queen of VRBO. But just learn about them because the numbers on VRBO versus rental houses is really different. I have two VRBOs and it's like having additional 12 paid for rental houses, just the two that I have. And so I would look into those. And then also when I started out, I would have bought nitro rental houses. I wish I would have bought some more higher end stuff because I had a job. So I didn't need the money. If I had those higher end houses, it would have been a lot less headache, but all worked out. But I wish I'd have done that earlier. Yeah, sure. Well, Cliff, hey, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show, talking about how you got started and how you've built the business around your lifestyle and able to have automated a lot of this and outsourced some of that to help you live that life you want and build that business towards doing that for yourself. So really cool to kind of hear your story and just kind of see what's working for you and your business. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. Now for the audience members that want to maybe learn more about you or showmetherental.com, where's the best place for them to go and check that out? Well, just to learn about it, you can go to showmetherental.com. If you've got any questions or any things I can help you with or whatnot, you can email me at any time at cliff, C-L-I-F-F at showmetherental.com. And then also I'll give you my phone number. I only answer phone calls twice a day during certain block times, but all right, be careful. I return messages <laughs> as soon as I can, but you can call me at 502-641-8781. Again, 502-641-8781. All right. Awesome, Cliff. Well, hey, thanks for that. As we're wrapping up here, any parting piece of advice you'd like to leave with the audience members? For a grand finale, I had something that was really life-changing for me, and it was an article of what people say on their deathbed. And so I remember reading it when I was really busy, you know, just when it was at the right time. And no one ever says on their deathbed, I wish I would have made more money. I wish I would have worked harder. I wish I would have worked longer hours. So think about that in your business and what you're in the business for. And if I can help advice is set it up from the beginning the best you can with the best intentions, not just money. And it's easy to say when you have money. So I want to make that clear. It's it's a little easier when you've been down that road looking back. But if I had to do it again, I made it the goal. And it was a lot of bad sacrifices I made to do that. I would have done it differently. Yeah, awesome. Well, Cliff, hey, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show today. Lots of wisdom, lots of actionable advice. Really appreciate your time. Looking forward to having you back on in the near future. So thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Cliff.
All right, that wraps up our interview with our guest, Cliff Hayden. Hey, I hope you got a ton of value from today's episode with Cliff. As you can tell, he has some really unique perspectives on real estate, from his perspective on debt to certain asset classes like those type A single family low maintenance houses. So that's the beautiful thing about real estate investing is there are so many ways to do it. Cliff has found a way to make it work for him. Now, what I really like about Cliff and his story and his journey is his perspective on building a business around his lifestyle and not building a life around his business. So I think that's a really important takeaway from today's conversation. If you'd like to learn more about showmetherental.com, you can find a special link in the show notes that will give you a discount. We didn't mention that on the episode, but Cliff was kind enough to share that with us. So if you'd like to check that out, once again, check that out in the show notes. Well, for more information, resources, and to connect with me, you can visit www.jacobairs.com. Till next week, engineer the lifestyle you want. You've been listening to the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom podcast, providing you actionable content to build your real estate empire. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for personal advice. The opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have a potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of the Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom, LLC, exclusively.